So thank you very much for the nice uh, introduction, which was really to the point. Thank you also for the uh, invitation here. It's a real pleasure to speak in front of you. You are uh, the future research in the Max Planck Society and beyond the Max Planck Society. So of course it's really an opportunity for me to tell you a little bit about the research, not only of myself, but uh, of the Institute for the History of Science, of my colleagues. Some of them are even here. And, uh, but I want to start basically where the introduction left it. I want to tell you a little bit about myself and how I came to such a strange field as the history of science. When I started my studies, the history of science existed already as a field in a sense for about 100 or 150 years, but not in a strong academic sense. It was mostly done by retired scientists and it was mostly done in a very descriptive way. People had the right uh, to do the history of science only after their career. Uh, there were no academic positions for it. So when I was studying physics, and at some point I decided to go into the history of science, my colleague said, you are crazy, you are risking uh, you know, your career. And it was just, I have to say, you know, in the aftermath it always sounds so nice, one has made one's career. It's a lot of luck to be able to make a career in science, but in particular in the history of science, I can tell you. And, uh, uh, but I want to tell you more about what motivated me to go, as it were, from physics to the history of science. So I like to uh, study physics, so not, there are some colleagues who left physics or chemistry or biology to do the history of those subjects because they were frustrated and unfortunately that doesn't help the history of science very much. I wasn't frustrated, I didn't leave physics because it was hard or because it was boring. I loved physics, uh, it, had, it was full of ideas, it had a very interesting long history. Uh, but I had the feeling that in my studies of uh, physics, I did a PhD in uh, physics, partly in Rome and partly uh, in Berlin, I had the feeling that I couldn't really understand how the concepts of physics came into being, how they were transformed, how they were developed. One learned a lot of technicalities, but I think the conceptual understanding was lacking. And I wanted to understand what made uh, these concepts, in particular how it could be that over time they change. There's a very long history, as you all know, going back to antiquity, but with many what we now call scientific revolutions in between. So I was first looking into philosophy and I was uh, trying to under get a better uh, conceptual understanding of my field doing philosophy, but then I found at the time it was uh, uh, analytical philosophy, so it was very formal and it uh, gave me a mathematical and a logical framework, but as I was already studying mathematics, I found the frameworks rather trivial and wasn't very inspired by them, and I found it much more fascinating to go into the real historical documents, and, uh, and I found that there were new worlds to be discovered. The first uh, person that I studied in some depth was Galileo Galilei. I was looking at some of his manuscripts, and I found out that what the textbooks tell you about somebody like Galileo was really completely wrong. Uh, he didn't, uh, he was, he, he didn't, couldn't have conceived himself just as a precursor of Newton. He was living in a world of his own, a very interesting world, a Renaissance world, and he was dealing with practical issues and he was taking practical problems seriously and trying to abstract from them some concepts. So I was discovering a new world. Eventually, I extended that interest. I became a professional history historian of science. And now I want to make a jump and I want to tell you a little bit how the field presents itself today and what I and my group are trying to do in this field today. So I won't go on telling you all of my biography, if you had been afraid, but I, I want to bring you up to speed and up to the present as quickly as possible. So how is the field looking uh, today? History of science is academically much better established than it was at the time when I started uh, to study. Uh, it's still, of course, much weaker than the established big disciplines like physics or biology, but there are some, some chairs, in particular in, in Berlin. We have been lucky uh, to get the number uh, of chairs. And history of science has now been broadly recognized as a field in the broader context of cultural studies. So many of my colleagues are studying the history of science like others study the history of art or the history of culture in general. And that is certainly a very important dimension because one has recognized now uh, through people like Thomas Kuhn, Paul Feyerabend and many others who have criticized the traditional view 
of a linear progress, so where scientific discoveries are building one upon uh, the other, that uh, science is intimately interwoven with culture. You cannot understand a scientific theory if you don't understand how the people who made those theories or who made those experiments were influenced by the political and economic and cultural constellations of their times. And there are many, many good uh, examples. So today, uh, history of science is history of culture. And that is not just a matter of uh, uh, treating science as part of culture. It's also a matter of understanding scientific knowledge itself better than it could be uh, understood when people were just focusing on the great heroes of science, on the great ideas, the discovery of uh, Newton's laws or the discovery of relativity or of Darwin's theory. So I want to give you a first small example for why the, under this broadening uh, vision of the history of science as a history of culture has helped to understand science a little bit better. And that's coming out of our work, but I just will briefly touch upon it. Uh, as I said, Galileo was studying problems of his time. Some of the problems that he was studying were technical uh, problems, such as the curve of uh, an, uh, a ballistic curve. So uh, it, this was the time where fire weapons were not quite new, but uh, became more and more professionally used by contemporary engineers. And there was a need for understanding both the chemistry behind it and the physics uh, behind it. And the need was primarily a practical need because gunners wanted to aim better and uh, wanted to know what they were actually doing. And uh, this is a typical uh, curve that you find in a contemporary gunner's manual. And it shows how people were thinking at the time. So they first thought that uh, the cannon uh, would shoot in a straight way because uh, the powder would carry the ball along this straight path, then its force would weaken, and then it would eventually fall down. Now, we all know from classical physics that is not correct. But can we say more than uh, just saying that this is not correct? Uh, if you look at what is written, I don't know whether you can see it underneath those curves, you can see a number of concepts that are written underneath them. The first part is characterized as being violent, uh, the last part as being a uh, motus naturalis, natural motion, and the middle part is considered as a mixed motion. So violent motion, mixed motion, and uh, natural motion. These are concepts that are, of course, no longer used in modern physics, but those were concepts of the Aristotelian understanding of motion used at the time. And so when we want to understand this, we immediately have to think not just of the practical context of ballistics, of gunnery, of artillery, we also have to think of the intellectual worlds uh, of the people at the time. And one of these intellectual worlds was, of course, Aristotelian physics, which was the predominant uh, doctrine, not just about nature, but of the understanding of the world. And uh, now the question is, how do you go from here, from this, if you wish, medieval understanding of motion to the understanding of motion that we, then, that we then associate with Galileo and with Newton. And what you have here is exactly what I have called earlier a scientific revolution. You, uh, today we distinguish between, in classical physics, between inertial motion and accelerated motion due to a force. So completely different concepts than the ones that were used. And the interesting question, and that's a long subject of research, is how do you go on from one conceptual system to another conceptual uh, system. And the answer, which I won't give to you in detail, but just uh, try to sketch, is that it has a lot to do with the practical experience of these gunners, because as wrong as these curves are, if you study them in detail and if you ask yourself a number of questions about them, you can learn a lot from them. For instance, how does such a curve behave when you change the angle of the cannon, when the cannon is shooting higher and higher until it's shooting vertically. So does it always shoot farther, or is there a maximum in between? You know, these are questions that we can ask naively, naively but the gunners, of course, could ask them uh, in a practical way, trying to make experiments to some extent. And so this kind of practical experience is part of the answer. But this is something that took place out of, strictly speaking, science. This is knowledge, practical knowledge, experiential knowledge. And this is the reason why I was showing you this example, because you can see, without taking into account the knowledge outside of science, 
you won't be able to understand the dynamics within science. And it's not just because uh, uh, Galileo got then a prestigious position at the Florentine court of the Medici. There are, of course, all the political and economic influences of science, which were very important. But it's knowledge itself that is subject to these social and cultural influences that can be illustrated by this example. So if we want to understand how theories in science develop, or how scientific thinking evolves, or how scientific experiments pursue, are pursued, we cannot do that without taking into account the world of knowledge outside of science. So that's the first message that I want to get across today. The history of scientific knowledge has become a history of knowledge. And we have to understand the knowledge in its broad sense. Of course, the relation between scientific knowledge and knowledge in, a, in this more general sense has changed. Because it is a characteristic feature of science in this early modern period. So we are talking 16th century or so here. Uh, to science is that this kind of practical knowledge was the main empirical source for science. And this is true practically in, in all branches of uh, contemporary science. So if you think of chemistry, for instance, metallurgy, what the alchemists were doing, was one of the major sources of chemical knowledge. Biology, the same thing. The pra practical uh, physicians were the ones who gave the most empirical Im input in science. That relation has, of course, changed over time. So again, it's an important large-scale historical question. When did this relation between science and practice change? Here it's very clear science owes to practice. Even after Galileo had established that the projectile trajectory is not such a crooked curve, but is actually a parabolic trajectory, and after Newton had derived it from his fundamental laws, what did it change about gunnery? Very little. It, it changed very little the technology of gunnery because the technicians at that time in the 17th century, early 18th century, were not yet able to control the parameters of shooting, of actual shooting, so precisely that they could make really good use of the scientific theories that had meanwhile evolved. And so science developed uh, benefiting from practical knowledge, but for the time being, giving rather little back to it. I don't say nothing, but rather little back to it. Nevertheless, even at that time, the expectation that science would eventually do so, would eventually be able to help practice and help economic development was already there. And that expectation alone was a major driving force in the evolution of science in this early modern period until we come to the period of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century when the conditions were created to use science much more systematically as a driving force of economic and technical innovations. So uh, I think that's an interesting story by itself about science because science has anticipated for a long time its practical use. I think it's a message that is important even for our uh, uh, current situation because uh, when, pract when uh, practical demands are uh, used in order to either defend the legitimacy, legitimacy of science or to demand science to justify itself by its practical utility, one often forgets that the time scale at which scientific innovations become in whatever sense useful is very different from the typical turnover times that we see in economic or let alone political development. So you can, you can see that this kind of inference, that these kinds of statements already require not just to study single heroes, how did Galileo find the law of fall, or how did Darwin come up with the uh, theory of revolution. It uh, raises large-scale questions. We have to understand something about the relation between knowledge and social development. So we have to understand scientific knowledge, and I have already emphasized that before, as a part of knowledge in a more broader sense. Now let me say a few words about knowledge and uh, use this picture as an illustration. So clearly, these are not two scientists uh, conversing with each other. It's probably a father and a son at some building place in Egypt uh, using sun-dried uh, bricks. This comes out from our project on the history of architecture. Maybe I will say uh, a little later something about this. 
So what they are transmitting here is clearly knowledge. And we have to take into account also that you know, very basic notion of knowledge in order to fulfill what I just have said. So what is knowledge? And you know, this is an interdisciplinary group, and this is an interdisciplinary, uh, uh, interdisciplinary colloquium. So you, you know, th then there you have a notion that you really can address only in, uh, in an interdisciplinary way. And of course, many disciplines that uh, deal with knowledge either don't question it, don't say what it is, or they have a very different approach to it. So if I come from cognitive psychology and I'm studying uh, uh, you know, thinking in children or in adults, I have a different notion of knowledge when, than when I'm doing sociology, for instance. Uh, the notion of knowledge that we are using have come to use because it's useful in our, uh, in our actual research has three dimensions. It has a cognitive dimension. Sometimes historians of science are very, and that what might surprise you, are very hesitant to use this cognitive notion of knowledge. Why? Very simple, because most of our subjects are dead. They are no longer interview partners, potential interview partners, like in psychology that we can interview and how they were thinking. The only thing that we really have from them are material traces, are texts or artifacts. So some of my colleagues hesitate to talk about how Galileo or how Einstein were thinking because we can't ask him anymore. That's, of course, nonsense. It's an extreme position. But we have to presuppose that our subjects had ways to think, had cognitive structures, and our task is to reconstruct those structures. But you can see already that's a very challenging task. And I have a bit exaggerated now with saying that there are historians of science who presuppose that uh, great scientists didn't think or we cannot say what they were thinking. But the question is, of course, how they were thinking. Were they thinking just like us, plus their ingenious ideas? What were their cognitive structures? How can we reconstruct their cognitive structures from the historical traces they have? What kind of theories from cognitive science or from psychology do we have to use in order to describe their thinking? You can see this is really a challenging problem. And there come fundamental philosophical uh, issues come into play here. For instance, to which extent and at which level is human thinking universal? Do we all have fundamentally, at least, the same notions of space and time? And what about causality? And what about force? What about weight? All of these notions. You see, we come into the realm of uh, classical philosophical epistemology Immanuel Kant presupposed that these fundamental notions of space and time, for instance, or of causality, are universally valid because they are part of our mental apparatus. But what, we, what do we as historians do with this? If we don't limit ourselves to just study uh, the great minds like Galileo or Newton or Darwin, but take into account that kind of knowledge here, what kind of concepts of space and of time do such people have. And in fact, in our institute, we are also studying uh, people without education, people who have developed notions of force or consider motion, for instance, in the Trobriand Islands. I had a PhD student, uh, I think she's actually now working here at the Charité, who went to the Trobriand Islands in order to find out how the people there thought about motion. Uh, did they have distinctions of motion like the Aristotelians had? distinguishing between violent motion that only happen because I exert a force and natural motion because they take place by themselves? Do they have a notion of weight, although they don't have balances? And there are classical questions of uh, uh, genetic epistemology, uh, uh, cognitive science dealing with children that are suitable to find out whether people have such concepts on their mind. And it turns out there are strata that are universal, and there are other strata that are not, that are dependent on the specific material culture that people have. For instance, she found that in cultures where people don't have a balance, they don't really have a concept of weight. Whereas these Aristotelian type of notions, where you distinguish between two classes of motions, one taking place by force and the other taking place naturally, that's a pretty universal notion. So you can see already, we have to combine the history of science with anthropological study in order to answer fundamental questions of epistemology, of the categories of thinking that people possess.
But knowledge also has other dimensions. So I have emphasized now the cognitive dimension. Knowledge also has a social dimension. And that social dimension is very well illustrated here by this picture because we are watching a transmission of knowledge. Again, the traditional, I, I use a little bit the traditional history of science, and you have to excuse me for that, as a straw man to make my points clear. So I'm depicting it a bit too naively and too, uh, too negatively. So I say the traditional history of science has just cared about the big white man, big old white man who, who did the great discoveries. So what they have neglected is that teaching, transmission, uh, migration of knowledge are very important dimensions. And here we are talking not psychology, what we are talking about sociology, the social dimension of science. Knowledge is part of social networks. It cannot survive in the long run without being uh, transmitted. But transmission, as you very well know, is not an easy process, and it's not a process that just means copying or reproducing. In transmission processes, transformations take place. Knowledge is appropriated. The, uh, it's not that I can implant my knowledge into the head of somebody else. That somebody else is always an active player. And this goes not just in interpersonal knowledge transfer. It also is valid for intercultural transfer. When we say today we are exporting Western scientific knowledge to other cultures, that is a highly active process on both sides in which knowledge is actually being transformed and changed in its structures. People have to appropriate knowledge to really uh, make it their own. And in this appropriation, they, of course, impose their own criteria, their own cognitive structures, and very often change the understanding and the notion of knowledge. I just give you a, a very simple uh, example that just comes to my mind uh, because it connects with my first example. And it may connect a little bit to what you know. Uh, so, you know, the classical story always goes, you know, these guys in the early modern period, they were still uh, very much dependent on Aristotle. Why? Because Aristotle was adopted by the church as the great thinker, and there was a kind of a dogmatic view on how the world is composed, very much colored by Aristotelianism. And so when Galileo and Newton came, who were anti-Aristotelians, they overcame this view and replaced it with a new understanding that you know, did away with these old prejudices of Aristotle. So in the 18th century, that new physics was appropriated in Greece as part of the growing emancipation of the Greeks within and from the Ottoman Empire. But for the Greeks, of course, Aristotle was not somebody that they could simply do away with it. It was their national hero. So much of Greek intellectual uh, self-understanding and national pride was related to Aristotle. So they wanted to have the new physics, which was seemingly so anti-Aristotelian, and yet had to connect it with their own national pride on Aristotle. So they constructed, they reconstructed the new Western knowledge that they got from you know, Western universities, like uh, the Italian universities that, they were, that Greek intellectuals were frequenting, bringing back uh, this new knowledge and trying to make a new connection to their homegrown traditional Aristotelianism, which was their intellectual hero. So you can already see in this process of transmission of knowledge, the knowledge that was transmitted had to be reconfigured, legitimized differently, connected and interpreted differently. And of course, this is a kind of, uh, you know, if you wish, even harmless example. But uh, in the case we are talking about transferring medical knowledge, uh, to cultures that have a different understanding of life and death and disease. These issues can become very, very harsh and very difficult issues. So, so much for the social dimension uh, of knowledge. And there is a third dimension that is also uh, connected, uh, that is also uh, can be illustrated by this picture. So, I think, you know, if they're not sitting in, uh, you know, a study room and, you know, discussing in the abstract, they're doing something together. They're building together. And this is the material dimension of knowledge. You cannot imagine that knowledge is transmitted without being materially represented. That may seem evident. Uh, and maybe it's uh, just a fact of cultural history. So the fact that we are sitting in this lecture room imposes a very hierarchical structure upon ourselves. You know, I'm standing here. You are there, and, and this is coming from uh, the Renaissance, where such lecture rooms were built, even from the 
early medieval anatomy uh, uh, lessons. And so it has a long history and it shapes the way that we are, uh, that we are communicating with each other in, in this moment. But that's not primarily the material dimension I have in mind. What I have in mind are much more basic material uh, uh, dimensions. For instance, when I teach uh, a craft, I have, to use, I have to use the tools of the craft in order to do the teaching. If I speak, I use language, and language may be self-evident, but still it's an external representation of my thinking. If we don't speak the same language, if we don't share a language, you cannot understand me. Writing is another external representation of thinking. Printing is an external, printed books, printed material, printed text is an external representation of thinking. And now you already get another historical dimension into the picture, which is the dimension of changing media over time. Now, you know, you will, uh, you will hear from me a little bit later something about the invention of language. I'm going back so far now. I'm trying to understand how language emerged. But, you know, even if we don't go back so far, uh, we can still talk about the media revolutions in knowledge. Knowledge, its transmission, its cognitive understanding very much depends on the media in which knowledge is represented. And we are today still living in a media revolution with the electronic media. So you can imagine that if I have this understanding of knowledge having a cognitive dimension, having a social dimension, and having this material dimension, I might be able to learn something from history also about our current transformations of knowledge. I'll give you an example. Uh, when uh, the early, uh, in, the early print, in the early modern period, when printing uh, was invented and, and used, much of what people were doing then is they were one-to-one -one trying to transfer the established manuscript culture into the new culture of books. And of course, you know, you hear the, the copies of the, of the monastery lamenting over, you know, the, 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 the information chaos that was generated by the new book culture, by the, uh, by the loss of authority that was in the handwriting, uh, and so on. So here are many of the complaints of those who oppose the digital revolution nowadays. But I think the other parallel that I indicated is more significant, namely that the first step was a one-to-one -one mapping of the traditional structures of knowledge into the new book culture. It took centuries, literally centuries, until some of the other things that today for us are self-evident, like the scientific journals from which we all use, were established as a canonical format for capturing knowledge in, in these very specific bits with the footnote apparatus, with the references on top of it. These were results of long historical processes. You know, it seems trivial to remind you of that. But if you talk with publishers today and you tell them, you know, we want new kinds of publications that are possible in the digital me uh, medium, and we just don't want to copy the print culture into the digital world because we want to use its uh, uh, intrinsic structure, we get a lot of the same arguments. We, and here's my connection to this open access business that was mentioned, friendly in the introduction. You know, we get you know loss of authority, information chaos. You no longer know whom to trust. You get exactly this kind of uh, uh, of, op of opposition uh, because people haven't understood that these structures are not engraved in stone. They are historical products, and they will change with history. And we have to shape you in particular because you're young. You have to decide for your science, for your curiosity, for your engagement as citizen, how those structures should be, not just to serve particular interest, political, economic interest, but to serve the interest of human knowledge and of science. Because that's, I think, what is at stake here. The internet is a wonderful platform, but it's not just a given. It doesn't come just out of the, uh, of the plug. Uh, you have to shape it. You have a, poli uh, a political and intellectual responsibility uh, for it in what you are doing. So three dimensions of knowledge, uh, cognitive, uh, social, and material. And now we have a system, because this is no longer uh, the knowledge of an individual that we are talking. We are talking about knowledge systems. We are talking about uh, uh, entire societies that possess, that share, that produce knowledge. We are talking about a knowledge economy. And for a historian of science now, it's a challenging task to understand how such knowledge economies evolve and how they are being transformed. And now the question is, what kind of models do we have in order to explain uh, these processes? And 
I'm personally, I, I won't even say we, but uh, with a few colleagues, we are exploring new models on how to understand this in terms of evolutionary history, which doesn't mean to have a one-to-one -one mapping from biological evolution theory to a cultural evolution theory. Some people do that, but I think it's much too uh, restrictive and reductionistic. Uh, but I think, uh, in principle, we can learn a lot. We can learn, for instance, that we are dealing with agents, with actors that have internal structures. These are the cognitive structures. They form networks. These are social structures. I will just very grossly, you know, just to give you a feeling that we are thinking in terms of such models. So they interact uh, uh, with each other in terms of networks. This is the social dimension. And of course, they are interacting with an environment. In this environment, they use resources, they use tools, and they use that environment also as external representation of their internal structure, like language, like writing, are external representation of internal cognitive or social structure. Think of a traffic light. A traffic light is an external representation of a social structure that is constituted by the traffic rules. So the idea is you have uh, networks cons uh, uh, consisting of actors with their internal structures, and those networks are now interacting with the environment just to survive. They have to reproduce. They have to have an economy. They have to work, produce, and consume. And this is, as you can see, uh, an alternating process of internalization. The simple most process of internalization is when you eat, or when you perceive, or when you understand. Uh, and externalization, because you produce things, you externalize your regulative structures, and then you're living in a new environment because you have changed the environment. And that's something that is very familiar to biology and is presently very much uh, discussed in current uh, biology, and it's called niche construction. Niche construction is an element uh, by which uh, biology is now enriching the discussion of mutation and selection as the basic forces of biological evolution by pointing attention to the fact that some species, think of beavers, uh, const not only uh, live in an environment that exerts selective pressures upon them, but they actually transform and create an environment. And of course, we humans are niche constructors par excellence. We really change our environment, but we don't just change our environment by using up our resources or by constructing technology. We also change our environment by expressing ourselves in a symbolic way, if you want. And there are great philosophical thinkers, I just mentioned Ernst Cassirer, who have thought about the role of this symbolic world that we humans create for ourselves. And that is also meant when I speak about the external representations. So now uh, I will give you some examples, just very briefly. I still have time, right? It's kind of hard to... Uh, uh, ten minutes or so? Or, or more? Give me a... Ten minutes is okay? Three minutes? Okay, <laughs> yes. Well, three and ten is a, is a little bit different. So I will end by just indicating uh, three examples uh, that go back very far back into history, but that I hope will show you how we apply this very broad thinking. You know, I have started from very specific examples of the history of science. I have tried to indicate you a little bit about uh, the relevance of these. Uh, of these examples. I have now made up sort of a huge scheme, and I will now show you how that scheme may help us to understand some of the fundamental issues uh, in human evolution. So one, uh, one problem is the origin of language. And language is a very interesting thing, because uh, uh, language is clearly in individual appropriation. And again, as you know, uh, uh, language needs to be appropriated. You know, there is a lot of innate structure here, as uh, people like Chomsky have claimed. But nevertheless, Chomsk, uh, nevertheless, language has to be appropriate. It has to uh, be learned over a couple of years. So there is clearly a biological and a cultural factor here. And this is why I think it is very plausible that also the evolutionary origin of language is not just a biological phenomenon, but is already a phenomenon of biological, cultural co-evolution. And uh, in, I think important to under, for understanding this co-evolution are exactly some of the uh, features that I have used to characterize knowledge. The cognitive structures, 
the social structures and the material structures. And the material structures are very often uh, neglected because the material uh, structures are not just the tools that uh, you know, are used since Homo habilis uh, came into being, I think 1.5 uh, million years ago, but it's also other forms of expression that construct our environment. Today we speak about language as a multimodal uh, phenomenon. My Max Planck colleague uh, Stephen Levinson from the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics in Nijmegen uh, has recently with some colleagues looked into the origin of language and has emphasized this notion of multimodal character. So I can use gestures, I can use body language, I, I can look gazes. All of this is part of the human communication process and there is a strong indication that these modes interacting, interacted with each other also in the genesis of language with gestures coming first and then vocalizations coming later. And so if I imagine this process now as a process of niche construction in which one symbolic culture preceded the emergence of another symbolic culture, I can see that I can conceive of this process as an interaction of biological and cultural factors because the culture changes the way that we think, that we observe today, and that was probably also the case at the origin of humankind. I give you... Uh, another example for this kind of uh, process from a little bit later uh, period, but it, that is no less fundamental. The so-called Neolithic Revolution. The Neolithic Revolution is usually associated with events taking place in the so-called uh, Fertile Crescent in parts of the Middle East around uh, 15,000 years before our time. But one has to remember, and this is very well known, uh, uh, meanwhile, that uh, the Neolithic revolution didn't just happen once, it happened in various places of the world. There are multiple Neolithic revolutions across the world. But they all have in common that humans uh, changed their natural environment in such a way that the natural environment became partly dependent. The reproduction of cereals that are human domesticated cereals has become dependent on human intervention. But humans couldn't foresee that when they started out uh, on this pathway. So how could this be achieved without the possibility of anticipating the results? So again, a wonderful example of such a transformative process in which uh, contingent circumstances eventually became part of an intrinsic systemic feature of the evolving system. Probably the story that uh, if I had more time I would expose to you is that sedentariness played a big role. People were cultivating plants and animals for a very, very long time. But only under certain contingent accidental conditions, they started to become sedentary. And these circumstances changed the long-term consequences of this cultivation, the pre-domestication cultivation. Eventually, it resulted in these transformed plants and animals that could then serve as an economic basis of the transformed societies. And then Neolithization no longer was so strongly dependent on the context in which it emerged originally under favorable ecological conditions. But people could take the seeds and the animals with them, migrate, populate Europe, for instance, and recreate the economy that they accidentally developed in, uh, in these favorable ecological circumstances, for instance, in the uh, fertile crescent about 15,000 years ago. So here you can see uh, what I think is a fundamental process uh, that goes for all of these major transformations. They are very much dependent on some external conditions that are favorable, in this case the ecological conditions, the presence of certain uh, uh, types of cereals or what later became cereals or, or of domesticable animals, and they are then transformed so as to become less uh, context dependent. And my last example, will, I think, illustrate how this logic can be carried over into an understanding of the social evolution of knowledge. It's about the invention of writing. Again, writing was not invented with the purpose of inventing writing in mind. Writing was invented because uh, people used symbolic tools for other purposes and then discovered a new purposes while they were exploring these tools. And the tools that they were initially using were accounting tokens, and this happened in the uh, late fourth millennium in Mesopotamia, in the Babylonian uh, cities, where people uh, were, uh, were embarked on a trajectory of urbanization, 
and use tools that they had earlier used in rural communities on a much, much bigger scale to count, to count uh, the harvest, to count animals, uh, to count products, to do simple administrative things. And by developing and uh, exploiting their potential, they eventually came up with such a rich symbolic culture used for these accounting purposes that it turned out that this symbolic culture could also be repurposed for the invention of writing. So again, writing emerged from a process in which now urbanization very much played the role that sedentariness had played earlier in the Neolithic Revolution as an accidental contingent circumstances, but that offered the potential of exploiting the potential inherent in those external representations. Because what I'm showing you are external representations of thinking, and it's a characteristic feature of such external representation that their potential is always larger than the original intentions for which they had been invented. And again, I think this is a very fundamental feature of this kind of knowledge development, that I invent something for a specific purpose, and then I have a social process and an intellectual process in which I explore the consequences of these material means, and I always find that the horizon of possibilities that is given by these means is larger than those for which they had originally been invented. Okay? So I think this uh, pays new attention to the kind of material tools that we are using. I have given you already the modern example of the internet and of the web that I think has a far larger potential. Think of the web as being invented originally at the CERN, this great uh, high energy research laboratory in Geneva for the purpose of communicating among high energy physicists. They used a convenient tool because they were a globally connected community and they needed a tool to transfer data and communicate with each other. So the web wasn't invented for Google or for Amazon, it was invented for, for high energy physics. And it then became, uh, underwent exactly such a process as I have here described to change it, those accidental circumstances, favorable circumstances that happened to be uh, uh, in there in, in CERN, led to the transformation of this new form of external uh, representation to make it a general purpose instrument, just as it happened with the invention uh, of writing. And uh, what we are trying, of course, to understand at the Institute is to follow those large-scale developments into very great detail, understanding how the modern natural sciences emerged from such processes and how they reacted and interacted with their social and material environments, eventually trying to understand our modern world with uh, its enormous role for science uh, not just as a specific branch of culture, as I mentioned in the beginning, but uh, as an underpinning of our existence, I would go as far as to say, for economic and political reasons, because the global challenges that we are facing today cannot be handled without science, but science is nothing that happens automatically. It's uh, something that, uh, that humans do and that humans can change and for which humans have to take responsibility. And I thank you for your attention.